Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours, where we answer your questions seven days a week. Now, you can ask those questions in Mokana, and you can vote on those questions. You can talk about the questions. You can do all these other things there. Uh, if you don't know how to get there, just go to askofficehours.global. Not ask, you, know, you can do that as well. But you can go to officehours, uh, officehours.global slash join. You'll get an email. It'll, tell, it'll have links in there that show you where to... Uh, you'll get an email every day, by the way. <laughs> and it'll show you links of how to get into Discord, how to uh, join Mukana, all of the fun things. Uh, and uh, and then uh, if you're not able to do that, uh, you can go to askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global. And throw your questions in there. Uh, when the next day or two, we typically will get them into the show. So um, uh, go ahead and throw your questions in either in Mukana or in askofficehours.global. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from Roscoe Jones this morning in Madison, Indiana. And Roscoe wonders, same scene, one camera shot, 24 frames per second. The other shot is at 23.98, and I need the dialogue from both. Where would you fix it, and how would you do it? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, it kind of depends on where your dialogue was recorded. Was the dialogue recorded on each camera independently? And why the heck did they shoot 24 even? Uh, because that's usually not a choice and make sure that it is actually 24 even. Sometimes they say shot at 24 frames per second when it's really 2398. Uh, but if they don't stay in sync, uh, you can pull one down 0.1%. You could do this in your editorial, uh, in your editorial software. I think they still have the ability to slow something down by uh, a fraction of a percent, 0.1 percent would slow it down to 2398. That's what we used to do in Telecine when we're taking 24 frame film and putting it onto videotape, uh, which is running at 2398. Although the sample rate of the uh, audio on digital video was 48 kilohertz, not 47952, which was a major disaster for a long time. But thankfully, we're past that now. And we shoot everything at 48K and 2398. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, you would to, to get the sound to sync up from those two. If one was recorded, I would use the sound from one camera unless the, the sound is only available on that second camera. Uh, it's different sound uh, and it's not in your mix. So then pull it down 0.1% and then just cut across. Yeah, Bill might have a better way, is more knowledgeable about editing than, than I <laughs> yeah. and can probably tell you exactly what tool to well, okay. Courtney, I think you got 99% of it right. The only thing I'd suggest is that software has gotten so smart, particularly in terms of transcoding audio and, and matching not only uh, frame rate, but sample rate, which is to my mind, a bigger problem because I get footage in all the time where two people have shot at two different sample rates and you'll see a drift apart over the course of time. Most of this stuff can be auto conformed by the really smart software. So if you're using one of the big programs, I would initially try just tossing the two pieces of footage in there, looking at the beginning and ending and seeing if you have any drift because it might be doing it in the background automatically. If not, yeah, a mezzanine transcode to get everything aligned at the same sample rate and the same frame rate would be a wise thing to make your life easier in post. I, as I said before, conform everything to the format that I'm going to be delivering in. So, uh, so I, before I get, before I even open my editor, um, everything is going to be an Apple ProRes something, you know, and it's going to be, if it's all 2398, it's all 2398. If it's 24, if it's 30, 60, whatever it is, everything is the same format. Everything is the same sample rate. Everything is the same. I don't, and I got to tell you, it just, everything runs so much smoother. <laughs> like, you know, I'm just lazy. I'd rather throw everything into a box, go have coffee or go, go to bed, come back and have everything just, just the way it needs to be. It plays back better. It performs better. I don't have, um, uh, surprises when I try to export. I don't have anything. So I don't bring anything into my, uh, into my system. I know that they say that they can do that. And a lot of people do it. I just find that my time is valuable to me and I don't want to spend any of it watching it try to figure this out. So, um, so the, uh, so what I would recommend is throwing these, uh, throwing whatever, decide whatever your delivery format is, throw stuff into it and conform everything in media encoder, compressor, whatever you want to use so that it all comes out and it's all the same and compressor will fix this in, in one pass. <laughs> so, uh, and, and so it'll, and, and then everything will line up. Uh, next question. Peter Rosado in Las Vegas, Nevada. Peter says, thoughts on how did they film this and how long does it take and what would it cost? And I think that's the drone shot everybody's been talking about. And there's an Instagram link to it if you'd like to watch it. Uh, go ahead, Jesse. 
Uh, lots and lots and lots of planning and rehearsal. That is a very long flight path in that video. And they just went over it and went over it and went over it. Uh, particularly when there weren't people in the bars and on the street, you'd be doing that in rehearsal. And it's one of those things, how long does it take? It takes as long as it takes. Uh, what would it cost? That depends how much, you know, there's maybe 10, 20 drone operators who could execute a shot like that in the world. It's what they, they ask for. And it looks like a first person, uh, you know, it's it's a, a FPV um, drone. So that that's, uh, and with someone obviously that has a lot of skill. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was going to say it's got to be a very lightweight uh, because they're going to have all kinds of <laughs> FAA violations uh, with this if they're flying it over a lot of people, which they are obviously, uh, at uh, if it's a heavy, if it's above a certain weight of drone. So it's probably a very lightweight FPV with a very good 4K camera on it and some image stabilization built in because it does. Uh, it's like a rock study uh, image stabilization uh, that looks really great. Uh, I don't know what drone they use. It'd be interesting if the article tells us uh, what they did. And of course, one of the hardest things is getting people to sign off on uh, letting people, you know, letting a company fly a drone through their bar you know, over the tops of their customers and in and around their chandeliers and things, you know, the insurance, I'd hate to bend the insurance guy. on this show. Yeah. And and if you're watching this uh, through Zoom, through uh, to the thing, it, you, it'll, it'll look cleaner if you watch the original. It's not going to, this has got a lot of movement to it. Um, but the, um, but what I, I guess I would, I would agree. I think that in general, um, I, pr I'm going to guess that they probably didn't ask for a lot of uh, approvals. Um, and just shot it, uh, that you can, in a lot of these venues, if you own the venue, you put up a bunch of things, say, hey, if you're going to enter today, we may be shooting and you may be on camera. Um, I, most of the time, people consider that good enough you know, to warn people on the way in uh, as long as it's clear. Um, so uh, so that that's probably what happened with these venues if they asked the venues for that. <laughs> um, and uh, they may have just done it, you know, but uh, but I think that there's a couple places where they're entering and exiting where the folks need to see know that it's happening. Everybody else, this probably happened so quickly, they probably, and, and it's dark, they probably didn't even, they probably noticed some little thing fly by. Um, they were all drinking and having a good time, so they probably didn't notice. If you it. hear something <laughs> buzzing around your head, don't swat it. It's not a mosquito. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but by the time they figured it out, it was probably, probably already through the system. So um, it's also probably a very small drone, um, looking at where, what it had to do. And it may be under the, um, a lot, it's still going to break some rules for the FAA, but it's under the licensable um, or a, a size that requires licensing is my guess. Um, it's a great shot. We'd love to, if, if we can figure out who, uh, who did it, um, I think. Uh, but also should, just communications to, to maintain control. It has to be, you know, fly for FPV. You have to get video out of it and, uh, and it has to be continuous. Otherwise, if it, you lose a drop out of video for the drone operator, he's going to crash into a wall because he can't be inside all of those venues at the same time. So yeah. let's you know, know, see if we can find amazing. him and bring him on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Paul Wallace in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Meta unleashes its Llama. The company's open source AI is now roughly on par with rivals from OpenAI and Google. Should we worry? Uh, go ahead, Jesse. Um, I'm not very optimistic when it comes to uh, ad-driven social media platforms. In fact, I might be most pessimistic about that of anything in the universe. Um, any Anybody whose brain has been adulpated by that normal model that's been operated by humans, once you introduce AI to it, uh, I get very, very worried. So if, yeah, yeah, I would be worried about meta dabbling in AI. Go ahead, Jeffrey. So we've uh, we've had a lot of conversations on this in the last uh, last couple of days here. I just installed Focus or F O O O C U S, which is uh, you can actually create images online or on your computer, uh, and I've been doing a good job. A lot of this stuff is basic text stuff, and I wouldn't be you know, it's like. When I tell my assistant to turn off the lights, if the internet goes down, I can't turn off my lights. So I want to have those basic functions. So I can say, turn off the lights, and it turns off the lights. So I'm expecting that we're going to have basic functionality come through our phones. So when we're not in a internet area or uh, a five, even a 5G area, at least we can uh, find out the time or, or get some basic information from there. So it'll eventually start doing a hybrid model. And yeah, we'll come to the phones. It's, it's just a matter of time. 
Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was going to ask Jeffrey, when it generates images of people, do they have no legs? Because it's, you know, it's from Meta and the Metaverse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> next, next question. Uh, going on to Robert Soji in Los Angeles. When would you use 47.952 kilohertz or 48.048 kilohertz sample rates for recording audio? Courtney? Well, this is kind of a throwback to the film days of uh, when we were filming and transferring things into uh, editorial, which was running at uh, 2398 and shooting at 24. It required uh, a pull down in Telecine. Since most things don't go through telecine, a few things still do if people that do shoot on film. So if you're shooting on film, uh, sometimes they would like you to shoot at 48048 to record in on the audio so that in telecine or transfer into digital format, they would pull it down. <clears throat> if you're shooting at 24 frames even, they would pull it down in telecine to 2398. And uh, therefore, it would uh, back the... Uh, sample rate back to 48K. So you would be at 2398, 48K, which is the standard for digital video. Um, and uh, 47952 is if you're pulling up, is is the rate you would be at if you shot at 48 and pulled it down uh, to uh, uh, 24. I mean, pulled it down to 2398 from 24. You shot at 48 originally. It end up, it would end up at 47,952. So that's why those uh, sample rates exist on audio recorders. They were for accommodating film shot at 24 uh, to get you back to 48K uh, in the transfer after transfer uh, to digital video. Marty? Yeah, Cartney covered that really, really well. Um, of course, you know, 48K versus 24K, you're getting a much higher resolution. But my question to follow up with Courtney is, how often would that decision to record at these particular sample rates be made during the shoot, or would there be a conversion afterwards? Well, I had a, a big argument with uh, Sony Pictures of America, <laughs> uh, and I wrote a white paper to them, and I met with all of the uh, – because they put out a white paper uh, with shooting specifications for all movies shot at Sony Pictures. Uh, and it and, and it uh, required everyone to shoot at 48048, you know, which made it problematic then because if you're going to use that sound elsewhere, it's at a, at a non-standard sample rate. And a lot of machines didn't even record, didn't offer to record at 48048 sample rate to begin with because they were trying to avoid sample rate conversion at all costs, you know, from, you know, resampling uh, because they thought it was bad. And sample rate conversion is no longer an issue anymore. Everything is sample rate converted on the way into these digital recorders anyway. So, uh, you know, uh, so I wrote a white paper that said, you know, do it in post, shoot everything and, uh, you know, uh, pull it up and edit and then pull it back down uh, when you go to your output uh, format and stay at 48K instead of going uh, sampling Recording original at 48048, which is non-standard, and some equipment like AES wouldn't handle it. Uh, so eventually they saw my saw, saw my way through and, and stopped release, uh, stopped uh, demanding that everybody shoot at 48048. I have done this for a while, and I have seen this frame rate once. <laughs> like, you know, like so, so it's a kind of put in perspective uh, after thousands and thousands of events and, and a lot of projects and some that are require actual film and all these other things. I just, everyone just shoots at 48. And I think Mickey uh, confirms that everyone, uh, yeah, he said we stopped pulling up and down nearly two decades ago. So, um, yeah, so, and, and I, most of my work has been done that where I had to think about audio has been in the last two decades. Um, and so I haven't, uh, yeah, we haven't seen this in a, in a long time. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next, and Douglas wonders, with Meta's newest Llama model, do you think we'll see more on-device large language models? According? I think it depends on device. Phones, it's going to be tough because, you know, it requires a lot of RAM. And they don't even tell you on an iPhone, they don't even tell you. Are they now still hiding the amount of RAM that comes in an iPhone? Because they didn't used to not tell you. Not uh, not storage, but actual RAM. Uh, because it takes, you have to load that model into RAM, so it has to be a fairly compact model to, to be swift enough. Uh, maybe you could do it out of your uh, storage uh, on the phone. 
But uh, so it requires a lot of storage to store that model to use the on-device LLM with an NPU built into the processor, the RAM. So uh, it depends on the device. Maybe with uh, tablets or with a with a PC where you have you can have you know 64 megabytes of DDR4 or something, uh, then it'd be large enough to fit that model and to do fast response local local LLM. Go, Bill. Uh, just from reading about Apple's approach, because that's the ecosystem I'm in, uh, the neural engine on their chips, I guess their 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 vision of the future is to do as much on-chip as possible, kind of consider what they call their secure enclave and their neural engine as an internal in-your-phone um, processing system for all this generative kind of stuff. And then the interesting thing to me is it's the first phone system I've seen where they're going to ask you every time they go out to access a large language model outside of the phone. And I think they're doing that because I think there has been some concern from uh, content creators about everything you shoot, everything you produce going up to the cloud and being up there where somebody theoretically could get to it. Uh, so I think we're going to see this trend with all the phones. That was the first place I heard about it. Now, uh, exactly with this question, I'm hearing more about processing on device rather than processing entirely in the cloud. I, I don't know anything beyond that about which is better or worse. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Llama's minimum system requirements is 8 gig of RAM. Uh, they recommend 16, of course, and that's just for text only. Uh, if you want to add video, uh, video to it, like I said, I installed Focus. Uh, that's also 8 gig of RAM, but it is, uh, also requires 4 gig of, uh, and of NVIDIA RAM, which means that there are machines that are, you know, average machines that are using an anything gaming machine in the last uh, three, four years will most likely be able to have the Llama or most AI models models put on. It depends on how fast it runs. There'll also be a list of commands, you know, like a spreadsheet of some sort that grows, but it, it won't be that much uh, storage that's needed to answer sp uh, specific questions that have been answered before. I think one of the big advantages that Apple's going to have is that they have a unified system um, in this process. And so they, you know, they know what the hardware is that's going out. They know what, what's, what's compatible. Uh, the fragmented nature of of Android is going to make it harder for them to build on device models because Apple's been you know, Apple can dedicate a lot of resources to this and know that it's all going on to many of the same machines with the same builds. And so I think you are going to see more on device. I think that uh, again, I you know we'll see if Apple can actually turn it over. The, the approach that they're taking on this is very hard to compete with. Like it is, it is not not impossible, but very hard that they will continue to do more and more work on the device, then more and more work in a protected, their whatever, their, their, their AI cloud or whatever they want to call it. And they're going to add, keep on adding more functionality to that. And then they have a release valve, which is ChatGPT and Gemini and everything else for anything else that they can't quite sort out yet as they keep on adding the abilities. So they get to a point where 90, 95% of everything that you ask is all sitting inside of this enclave. And then it goes out only when you get to that last 5%. That, that is a very, very difficult model for anyone else to do because their markets are so fragmented and their, and their use cases and hardware are so fragmented. And so it'll be really interesting to see how this, how this goes down. I do think there'll be more done on the device, um, but I think it's going to be much harder outside of that environment. Um, next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, back again with this one. When would you use a crewing agency and what are the caveats? And he's got a link there to one of them. Jesse? Rarely. We would very rarely use a crewing agency, especially for key positions. For stuff like PAs, assistants for the day, it is, um, you know, it's feasible to hire somebody that is being vetted by a third party that you're kind of just paying to vet. But in general, uh, we, we want, f you know, a, a relationship, a, a recommendation from somebody we trust. This is, you know, a one-to-one -one business where word is everything, your reputation is everything. Um, just looking at this specific site, uh, they, you know, it, mm, uh, do you need the very best local talent based in Kansas, Canada, or Cairo? Our production managers know who they are. That's, uh, the person who actually knows the best people in Kansas, Cairo, and whatever the Canada, um, they are not cheap. That, that person who actually knows those people is really expensive. And there's just like throughout the website, there are little typographical errors. Um, they have a list of equipment and 
the equipment is not equipment they own. It's just a list of equipment that leads you to like, if you click on the link, it leads you to Adorama or to BH Photo for a picture of the RED camera. It's just like it, the website doesn't really inspire trust. And um, that's that's all that's that's our economy is trust. So I, I could see using something like this for, for PAs or assistants, not for key crew. Courtney? Yeah, I, it would depend on, you know, the crew, uh, the crew positions you're trying to fill. If you're just tr- you need warm bodies like PAs or uh, just, uh, you know, third grips, uh, not your key grip, but, you know, just hammers, as we call them in the industry. Uh, somebody with a hammer will show up and will say, you know, go go nail that to that and go nail that to that. They can do it. Uh, but, you know, I've I've seen these uh, crewing uh organizations i've been members of some for a while in the early years back in the 70s and 80s uh they never turned out to to find any jobs uh and like jesse says the best way is through referrals from known quality quantity quality persons out there someone you trust that knows the job will recommend somebody that they refer when they're too busy you know or booked on a job that's the best way of hiring uh skilled crew members uh, these crewing agencies <clears throat> are primarily for you know, like, like filling uh non non skilled positions i guess I, you know there's some skill involved they have to know which end of the hammer to hit the nail with but you know other than that it anybody with a, a high degree of technical expertise is probably not going to be found through a crewing uh, uh, a crew control you know, website like this. They all have agents these days and you'd contact their agents to book them. Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, Courtney, you hit the nail on the head. You said, I, I used to do these in my early days. Pretty much everybody you're hiring through sites like this are in their very, very early days. And this one actually has, uh, you know, show reels of the talent that you can get. And it's obviously like maximum three person crews that they're shooting with. Like the, the DP that they're recommending has never worked with a, you know, more than not. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in absolutes. This is just my read on the site. I apologize if I sound like I'm being really harsh on the site, but it looks like smaller crews for the DPs that they're they're on offer. So early days. These are early days talent that you're getting through these sites. Marty. Yeah, I remember this company started, I think, in in the D.C. area here where I am, and uh, independent production companies, smaller production companies and features, uh, they use these these agencies to hire crew because the the agency became the employer of record and took care of all the taxes uh, and all of that, so it became easier for the company to to deal with hiring people. Uh, they didn't have to go through all the employer uh, <clears throat> rigmarole and deal with an, an independent contractor versus employer of records. So that was one of the benefits. Um, and, you know, they, they found regular people that they would hire through these agencies. That's, that's what they started out trying to do. And then, you know, I'm not sure where they are now because I haven't run into them in a long, long time. Go ahead, Craig. Uh, one other thing to consider with this is that if you're hiring through a third party like this, an agency like this, um, some of your budget that you could be spending on your talented crew is going to the agency. So if you've got the the time and the, the availability to, to hire directly, uh, then you can afford to give them, you know, to hire better people by having more funds available for that rather than spending it on the, the uh, crewing agency. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree that it's kind of a, a, a last resort type of thing that you tend to do when you go into a new town that you don't have a lot of contacts and you, you don't have a lot of, or the people that you're normally working with aren't available. It's not that we never use crewing agencies, but um, I will say that oftentimes, we got somebody with an open mic. Um, uh, the, I, I will say that we, it's not that we never use them, but, but again, it's oftentimes for utilities, um, for PAs. Uh, we will occasionally use them for um, less important camera operator positions um, so that, that if we just need to cover something, someone to kind of move things around, we're assuming they've used a camera before. Um, but that's about it. Um, I think a lot of crewing agencies also do solve union issues. And so it was talked, um, it was mentioned, I've already talked about uh, agency or a uh, employer of record. A lot of them will have the, they'll be signatories on the union uh, for union calls. And so if you need to put that, you know, get a union team together, sometimes that becomes a little easier, especially in spaces that you're not used to doing it. Um, and so that, that is um, a lot of, but, you know, obviously almost everybody tries to avoid 
a crewing agency if they can, mostly just because you just don't know what you're going to get. Um, and we, we, again, we use them. We try to hand pick most of what you're going to see on screen um, with people that we've worked with in the past, the people who are very uh, talented. And you, but oftentimes you, you have eight core people or six core people and you need 15. And, you know, where are you going to find them in, in the time frame that you have? And that's where crewing agencies become useful. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was going to mention the same thing about the employer of record. And it's not necessarily most of those employers of record, like um, entertainment partners, cast and crew. Those are big payroll companies that uh, come out of Hollywood that uh, most crews are paid out of, even for major motion pictures. They will, they've, uh, most of the studios have offloaded their payroll uh, for uh, crew members to these uh, employers of record, entertainment partners, cast and crew, to let them handle all the payroll problems. And they are union signatures. So you don't have to worry about uh, the problem of, uh, you know, abiding by all the union regulations. That's their problem. Uh, they have to enforce that. But uh, they are not hiring halls. In other words, you don't list, you don't go to entertainment partners and say, put me on the list. Uh, there is a thing uh, that is the uh, work availability list or the, um, <clears throat> Contract Services Administration, which keeps a list of all eligible crew members. Uh, and it uh, you don't go to contract services to find a crew member, but once you find a crew member, you have to clear them. If it's a union shoot, you have to clear them with Contract Services Administration to make sure that that uh, union person is still an active member of the union, is has attended all his safety courses, and is registered in the classification for the job in which you're hiring them. So that uh, contract services administration is set up by the Producers Guild of America to, to uh, control uh, all of the insurance issues that are had between hiring people independently. And so that offloads that from the payroll companies to contract services administration because they have to administer safety and uh, eligibility to work. So it, and it's a complex situation. It's not normally handled by the production company themselves these days because of all those uh, complexities. And yeah, also with mixed crews, you know, those, the uh, payroll companies, although it's not, it's frowned upon, can hire, uh, you know, let's say the DP is union, but, uh, you know, the gaffer you want is non union. They have two different payroll companies that they can bill. Uh, each of their uh, time through. So you can have your union uh, DP and your non-union gaffer, although it's against the union rules, but they do it all the time to get away with it on sp small productions that aren't. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of times if you become a signatory, uh, you, you're expected to do it for all your productions. So even my my last company, uh, not the one I'm in currently, we ha I, I built a separate company that just did payroll for union <laughs> like, so it basically was a completely separate company that did all the all the union calls um through there um and then and then i was able to operate independently from that um next question next one from craig kadoki in toronto apparently is for me bill how do you monitor the camera from one ios device to another go ahead bill so we were talking about this pre-show and i uh Typically, I've made no secret about this. Love going to Comic Con, and I shoot still photos while I'm there. I do not do any video work, and so early in the process, as I was learning of my phone, trying to figure out this is probably two or three years ago, I realized that through the built-in Apple apps that you've already got, one iPhone can talk to another one through Bluetooth, and you can offload it. There are small uh, apps like Remote that kind of comes built in. Uh, and if you're using the default camera, particularly if you haven't offloaded your video recording to some other program, there's a pretty good ecosystem there. It uses uh, Bluetooth, uh, typically Wi-Fi sometimes if you need it and you're in a circumstance where you have a Wi-Fi network. But for me, I use a monopod, camera mounted to the top of the monopod. I have a clamp and a secondary rig, and I use my older I, uh, iPhone. I always keep the last version as well. In this case, it's larger than my iPhone that's on the end shooting the pictures with a better camera. And it's fabulous for two circumstances. If I want a low angle shot to be able to turn that monopod upside down, move my camera down to two or three inches above the surface. I did that for the... Uh, the big uh, in the desert rocket launch stuff for office hours. It's a great point of view, but I don't want to get down there and try to see my shot. So by remoting it through Bluetooth to the secondary monitor, I'm able to monitor my shot 
while I get the shot I want. And typically for high angle work as well, it's really useful. I take these rigs to Comic-Con because we often find I'm often in a huge crowd. And one of the perspectives that I think really helps the audience understand the event is something maybe 10 feet up. So if you have an extensible monopod and you can keep the monitor on the bottom of it and operate the camera, you're in good shape. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. Would the UAD Apollo X16D be a useful main interface for a small studio if you already had a Dante front end, or is it more useful as a live processing image uh, engine similar to a Waves server? Go ahead, Greg. Uh, yeah, I think that for a small studio, regardless of your your front end, um, all the I/O on this is is Dante, except for. Uh, an in and out of AES gives you two channels and two channels out for monitoring uh, on balanced XLR. But for for a local I.O., that's not really what you need. If you're running something, uh, I know Douglas has the uh, the DM3, I believe. Um, you know, you've got the the outs already on that. So this really is just for for uh, using as a processing engine for plugins. Next question. Next one comes to us from Evan Troxel in Talent, Oregon. Has anyone on the panel used Fizz Measure to analyze their room acoustics for optimal seat location in relation to their speakers for audio mixing? Thoughts? And he's got a link to the product. I have to admit, I didn't even know it existed until you asked the question. I, it's, it's really interesting. This is by from Rode. And uh, Rode has um, this, this is a, uh, you know, analyzation tool. A lot of us have these kinds of tools to measure rooms and so on and so forth. But I didn't know that Rode was making one. Um, so um, it, it looks like it's, uh, uh, I think that there is a, again, I didn't, there's a $500 license, a, a $99 license. So they're tucking under a lot of the current ones. Um, it'd be interesting to see what they, um, you know, uh, what, where they're going with that. Um, a lot of us use things like SMART, S-M-A-A-R-T, uh, for this kind of analysis. These look like very similar anal uh, analyzation tools, but I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of experience in some of the ones that are more established. <laughs> so, so it'd be interesting to see. Uh, but it looks like Rhodes putting some time into it. I, I all, often thought, I mean, a lot of the, the the tools that we use right now, again, the smart tools are the ones that I see the most often. You, you felt like they were falling behind in both pricing as well as interface, um, even though they're, the tools are bar none, some of the best out there. Uh, and you felt like eventually someone's going to figure this out and do something. It looks like Road might have done that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. It might take them a little time to uh, to come around the, a corner. Um, uh, Mickey said that uh, optimal seat location, uh, best to adjust monitor placement. Um, next question. Next one comes from Aaron Cody in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm entering a, the world of previs. I'm excited about what can be done with Unreal Engine. Do I still need to learn vector works or should I leapfrog? It depends, I would say. Uh, the, the advantage of Vectorworks is there's a lot of integration with uh, lighting packages and infrastructural packages. So we see a lot of people building building in Vectorworks to previs. Um, there is a lot of, um, uh, um, yeah, so I think that that's, that's the big advantage is that it's very standard to deliver Im um, models in Vectorworks and people definitely expect that at a certain level. Um, so I think that if you're trying to do like, this is the truss and the lighting and the staging and everything else, there's a lot of people that you work with that may expect to see Vectorworks um, as part of that process. If you're trying to just previs and, and you're only sending pixels, not geometry. So that means you're just sending videos. This is what I want it to look like. You can use anything you want. And that's where Unreal comes in. Uh, but we have used Unreal as a previs tool. Unreal has What's cool about it is it has DMX. Um, it has a lot of uh, a lot of those stage models and a lot of the infrastructure models built into it. It's just not as accepted within the industry. So it just depends on are you sending this to another light, lighting designer or someone who traditionally builds stages and lighting rigs? They're going to expect Vectorworks. Um, can you do it in Unreal? Absolutely. Is is Unreal probably better in the long run if you if you're really good at it? Quite possibly. <laughs> so so it just really depends on 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 who you're sending this to and how you have to interact. Uh, next question. Ronnie Hofsoy in Tromsø, Norway. How to test the measurable quality of mixers preamps? I have a different I have different signal generators, but not sure what to look for. Noise floor, maybe compare input and output and look to the delta. What else? Marty? Yeah, I think you're on the right track. So any of the um Audio acoustic measurement tools that we were just talking about from Rode. Um, there's RE, 
REW Room EQ Wizard. There's Open Sound Meter. Both of those are free free tools. Anything that you can um, uh, <clears throat> input a a reference signal, which would be your um, your test signal, uh, as well as a microphone or the output of the device you're testing, and then compare them in in the software, and that will show you the delta or the difference between the input and the output is w I, what you're looking for. Go ahead, Craig. Uh, yeah, scoping it is is always a good option. Uh, one of the difficulties with scoping a mic pre is uh, when you're doing a comparison like in smart when you can have both traces uh visible is you still need to have that original source amplified um so that's one thing uh, the the standard sort of response is always going to be use your ears uh listen to what what you're hearing what the preamps give you and uh in what range you're running the preamp um you know it's it's a well established you don't want to have to have your preamp wide open to get get your uh your level correct because that's the least efficient area of the preamp um one thing that i always try and listen to is uh, uh the the transient response of a mic preamp is something that i find really important uh and that's something that not a lot of people talk about but that's another another rabbit hole go ahead courtney yeah, one thing to test for is internal noise uh, for the noise floor is you put a resistive load across the microphone input, like 150 ohms across two and three, and uh, then crank the gain up and uh, and measure the noise floor of the internal circuitry. The other thing you can do is hook up a sweep generator uh, to your input at the nominal mic level signal. And uh, make sure your sweep generator uh, on a look at it on the scope, and make sure as it sweeps from you know sixty hertz to twenty thousand hertz that it maintains the same RMS level throughout the sweep. And then you can use that to test if you have uh, you know uh, uh, three band equalizer or something in each mic channel. Set them all to zero and make sure they're not uh, causing peaks or, or valleys at certain frequencies so that you know you have a handle on the accuracy of those knobs that you can be twiddling later uh, and drop the equalizer in and make sure it's uh, flat so that you start from a, a base. But, uh, you know, some microphone inputs uh, are not uh, perfectly flat and that makes them sound better. So <laughs> it, it's a matter of taste uh, so that some some add color that is is favorable to the ear. So don't necessarily go for completely accurate input to output. That just gives you a starting point, uh, lets you know which way to tweak the things uh, for repeatability. But uh, yeah, it can be, you know, when things are set flat, it can, one mic preamp can sound better than another because it does color the output somewhat. I one thing that I thought was interesting, I was watching um, a mix with the masters and one of the things that the engineer was doing was recording as cleanly as possible and then playing it out through Pro Tools into all the hardware. <laughs> so so, so the, the initial records were all as pristine and flat as they, they could actually absolutely make them. And then they're sitting there looping it in through um, through their system and running it through different compressors and running it through all the different things. But they're not they weren't trying to do that in the original record, which I had not. I have to admit that I had not thought of. <laughs> like, and I was like, mm, I hadn't thought of that. That would be useful. So so that's another another thing to think about as well. Um, next question. Tony Molin, Noonan, Georgia. Up next, thanks to Mr. Tlaloc Lopez Waterman. My setup is complete. I have a port free on my ATEM Mini Pro. What device should I add? I can add a MacBook Pro, Raspberry Pi, or an iPad Pro. Which device to add? Uh, go ahead, Jesse. I would go with the iPad for two reasons. The first is that, you know, just like the MacBook or the Raspberry Pi, it can do all the things that you need to do, video playback, you can access websites, all that junk. Um, but what it can also do is that you can write on it either with your finger, you can get a pen and kind of make a telestrator out of that device. The other reason I would go with the, I, uh, the, the iPad over the MacBook is because when we're in production, we're much more likely to need to pull a laptop for any of the other million things that we have to do in our chain than we are to pull an iPad. So it's a lot easier for us to dedicate an iPad as video playback, as website access, uh, you know, as Telestrator on our, on our video switcher than it is to dedicate a laptop. I'll go ahead, Craig. Uh, yeah, not knowing what your other inputs are, uh, I'd be tempted to go another route if you can and put in a uh, Apple TV 
then you could scare, uh, share your MacBook or your iPad or other devices to it whenever you wanted. It just uh, another alternate. Yeah, that's actually what I do. My, one of my outputs is, or one of my inputs is an Apple TV, which means any iOS device that can AirPlay can can go to that. Yeah, good guy. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, but uh, now that you're you're up to that level, it's time to start looking at the ATEM Mini Extreme. So you could have eight inputs, and then you could add all of those, and then you'll be, you know, on your next level. But I know that you do a lot with the house worship stuff, so whichever one that uh, makes sense for the majority of what you're doing. So if you are doing a scripture app and you want to be able to get there quickly, look to see um, – what format the screen is of that app, because a lot of times the iPads don't completely fill the screen on a on a 16 by 9 screen. So just look and see which one actually looks best for your viewers and for the majority of what you're doing and the ease of use during your show. Because if during the show you're having to do two steps with one device versus one and the other, then I would try to do ease of use and stick to you know being a good host instead of worrying about the technology or find somebody else to remote in and help you out and lend a hand. Courtney? Well, you probably guess what I'm going to say. Melee, Quieter 3, uh, not only does it give you the ability to run any Windows programs if you do, uh, much unlike uh, iOS devices, uh, you have an open file system and it sits on the gigabit Ethernet on your Ethernet. Uh, it has all the ports you need. It has uh, two HDMI outputs that uh, will work just fine, plus three uh, USB 3, four USB 3 inputs, so you can hang additional uh, media files off of it. Uh, it has, it can have a internal, uh, you know, four terabytes of storage, and you can get them for under $200. So uh, a, a handy thing to have uh, to run the software that won't run on iOS and uh, to be a source for playback. Uh, I've even run DaVinci on the quieter fours. I've run DaVinci Resolve and I can do color correction, everything that DaVinci Resolve can do. will run on a uh, quieter four because they come with 16 gigs of RAM. Next question. Marty Atias in uh, Maryland says, I now, uh, now that the IPMX core standard is published, how could it affect how we work with AVOIP? And he's got a link there. And, Cor and Marty goes, Marty goes out. He's got the ball. He throws the ball to himself. <laughs> It's a, what we like to call it here in the Cochran. business. He's throwing a Cochran. Yeah, all right. No, I'm, really, I'm really curious to know, to, to find out what people um, are thinking about this because it's it, it looks really interesting. It's an open standard that sits on top of ST2110. And the promise is that it will make communications from audio and video devices universally compatible across networks um, and between devices and between brands. It's it's one of those things that's sort of bringing everything together. Um, so, and it's it's a develop, it's been developing for many years. The, the, the core part of the standard is now, is now published and finalized and um, it's out there for, for, for manufacturers to try and start and play with. And, you know, what do you all think about this? It's possible. I mean, you know, the, I think that the, the hard part is, is timing, you know, so NDI has its own audio protocols now. Uh, you know, Dante, of course, has taken quite a, a leadership position in this area where a lot of people have it. But a lot of people um, also uh, are pushing back a little bit on licensing, you know, for Dante and, and so on and so forth. So there's an advantage there. Ravenna is what a lot of folks are using at heavy scale um, or when they don't want to license Dante. Um, so we see a lot of different, um, Maddie shows up every once in a while and you're just like, oh, what am I going to do with this? So anyway, so um, uh, for me anyway, <laughs> like a lot of us are just like, Maddie, uh, you know, uh, how limited? Um, so anyway, um, but easy. Uh, that's the big advantage of Maddie is it just works. Um, barring some clock issues, not that I'm bitter. Um, so anyway, um, the, uh, uh, so I think that, you know, I think that there's a possibility. One of the challenges for standards committees now is that manufacturers are getting ahead of them. So companies are doing a lot of this stuff super fast and they will make up their own their own standards because the standards committees aren't moving fast enough. And I think that, that the standards committees have to start figuring out how to accelerate because what happens is they go, okay, we have the standard, but there's already a ton of equipment and workflows and everything else that are already in the industry by the time. They, I think it, it used to be, you could spend a couple of years on a standard and then you could put it out and then the manufacturers start adding it. The problem is now they're just adding it as fast as it comes out. And that and that puts a lot more pressure on getting the standards out much faster than what, what's happening right now. And this is what we see with 2110 in general is that either people are going to NDI or you have Blackmagic building, you know, still something within the spec 
but not, you know, not what they had planned originally. Um, and so all those things are, are moving because they're not moving fast enough. You know, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, the problem with this is it's been tried so many times in the past uh, of an extensible, you know, uh, standard. Uh, to develop a standard, it has to and accommodate a variety of different pieces of hardware. Uh, it has to be extensible because that hardware changes from year to year. And once it's extensible, people make changes to it to to accommodate the newer newer equipment that's out there, which means that if everybody's not on the same page with the same version, it's gonna you're gonna end up with incompatibilities. They tried this with IXML for metadata in audio files. And the problem is since it's extendable, uh, you know, using uh, MXF uh, uh, extensions, uh, each manufacturer would put its own schema on there, uh, their own extensions on there to handle their hardware, but it's then no longer a standard. You can't interchange that metadata with something on another brand because it may have its own schema, which doesn't recognize all the metadata that's coming from the other manufacturer's schema. So making an international standard is very difficult because you got to get everybody to agree to it. And to agree to it, you've got to freeze it at some point. Uh, if you make it extensible, it makes it extremely hard to manage and keep as a standard and inter for interchangeability. Good morning. Yeah, so th this is not a, a, a protocol that's going to replace any manufacturer's product, but it seems to be a framework uh, on which manufacturers would adhere to make them compatible with other products in the way that they communicate, in the way that they provide data. Um, and so I, I think it's something to really, you know, keep an eye on. Um, IPMX.io uh, is a place where you can get all the information. And there's a, a number of agencies and standards organizations that are playing a part in planning this. So uh, keep an eye on it. Yeah, I, I think, again, I just think that everybody has to move faster. I mean, I think they're still moving at this academic speed and the internet just moving, the, the industry moves way faster than academic speed now. And they just need to, if they don't do these things about 10 times faster, they're not going to, it's not going to matter that they did them. Um, next question. Next one comes from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. I'm using Final Cut Pro for the iPad and I'm enjoying it, but I don't have a use case for it at the moment. Is it worth continuing to pay $4.99 a month for it when I really can't justify having it? Good, Jeffrey. I think you just answered your own question there, Tony. Um, if you don't have a use for it, you shouldn't. Uh, if you have $4.99 a month to really just waste having it sit on your iPad, then go for it. You can always subscribe to it at any time. And right now they have, they do have the free trial. I've been, uh, uh, I'm, I'm getting ready to do a video on how to use the multi-cam through uh, a couple iPhones. And uh, I'll probably use it for that and, and probably turn it off until I have a really good use for it. But yeah, if you don't, if, if you have the money to spend and just let it sit, then yeah, go for it. Otherwise, wait. Good, Bill. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same camp, but Tony, I, I know you do a lot of work and it's interesting, but this is not a core technology. I'm keeping my eye on it, definitely. And I, there's going to be a gig that's going to come up where I think this is the perfect solution for that. But right now, I'm not doing anything practical with it. I'm not subscribed to it for that reason. Uh, I think if I was starting out, if I was back in my 20s and I was looking at what's going to sustain me, I would be all over this because I know they're going to continue to build it out and add functionality to it. And if, like me, you're already conversant with Final Cut, the using this as your field production solution and then bringing it into your editorial suite afterwards is a really powerful thing. But if you're not doing that kind of field production and those kind of shoots, I think it's just something to, to keep your eye on. So my vote is kind of, nah, probably not. Jesse? It's a lot easier to cancel subscriptions when you think of it as a backdoor equity grab. So this is your business. You're going to be running. If this is your business, you're going to be running it as long as the business is alive. And every subscription is taking a percentage of your business. That is equity. And it's really easy to drop subscriptions when you realize all these companies just assume they deserve equity in your business. Next question. Daniel Partridge in Rochester, Minnesota says, two companies I work for who have Yamaha DM3s have been told Dan Dugan is in the works and one of them has been told to be limited to eight channels and most likely next year. I 
think this is true or just a rumor sales tactic to get them to buy DM3 units? Go ahead, Craig. Uh, yeah, it sounds reasonable. That's uh, that's very much uh, in Yamaha's uh, you know history that they do that, and that would be a typical channel count. So it sounds reasonable, but no one will know until Yamaha actually announces it. Next question. Rajan Sandal, Los Angeles, California. Apple's new iPhone mirroring feature allows you to interact with your phone on your Mac. Thoughts? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Um, so, yeah, I've been uh, playing with the uh, the iPhone and the Mac. Uh, of course, I'm using my older iPhone rather than my newer one because you have to have the beta software on it. And unfortunately, it is just beta at this point because there's been a lot of problems with the mirroring happen. When I first connected it up, it wouldn't connect up. I had to actually reboot the uh, Mac for it to work. And then I was having problems with uh, sliding, opening apps, and uh, and things like that. I remember when I had my Windows phone uh, use uh, a, the same type of mirroring on my Windows machine. It was great. I loved it. So I can't wait for that functionality to happen on the Mac. And uh, it's just got a little bit more time before it becomes production. Courtney? Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. We've had this built into Windows since Windows 10, uh, the phone feature. And now they have the ability to actually run run the apps locally on your Windows machine. So welcome to the world, uh, Apple. That, uh, you get to, uh, hopefully once they get all the bugs worked out, get the same features now on your uh, iPhone and your Macs. Good, Bill. The only thing I, I know people who use this for is purely demos, particularly software demos. If you want to show your iPhone implementation of a program that's running and you want to do this in a video that you're producing in 16 by 9 for the regular YouTube distribution, and you just want a window to pop up and be able to interact with it as if you were interacting with the phone itself, it's fabulous for that. Outside of that, I haven't really found any use cases for it. So it's another one of those things that I know I can do, but I don't do very much. And it's just because I'm not doing those kind of demos. If I was a content creator, though, I'd be all over this. Next question. Next one, Gordon Lake, Los Angeles, California. When you move your switching to the cloud, are you also committing to getting your graphics and clip play out from the same system? A good guy. It depends. It depends on your crew. I mean, you could do it yourself and have it all on the same machine. You can also be on comms and you could have somebody else doing the graphics play out. This last event that I was on, the feeds that we were doing were just basically a backhaul. And even though we had the capability to do graphics on the ground, uh, it was sent up to the cloud and then they added the graphics. They were just basic graphics, but I, I felt like out of control because I wasn't sure when they were going to take and when what graphics they were going to apply. So I didn't know the framing and it was a lot of just, and we weren't on comms. And so a lot of it, was, and this was for broadcast. So a lot of it was just like, hey, try to back off and let them do their job and just do your job and stay loose and uh, don't, don't commit because you don't want a, a graphic over the top of a graphic. So if you're going to do it you, with a, another team, you need to make sure that you're all on comms and you're ready to hit that that uh, on cue. Uh, look at some of the uh, VizRT. Uh, there is a uh, learn upon, they call it, uh, VizRT University, and they have a whole a whole section on this just about how they're using the Mosaic and some of their, their other uh, – integrations that work with vector. So they're not just using vector, they're using mosaic and then pushing stuff over the top of it. So take a look at uh, some of those university uh, um, uh, tutorials. Yeah. And, and um, I know that we've done it a couple different ways. Um, but I think that what I'm kind of leaning towards for the stuff that we're doing with vector um, is probably everything's going to be in the cloud. And it's just a matter of how they interact with each other, but they don't necessarily have to be the same machine. For basic graphics, Vector is going to have what we need. This is as an example. And again, you can do the same thing with vMix. A lot of them, you can do a lot of these things in real time, I mean, in, inside the app. But th there's no limit to what you can do with having separate th things. And they can be on-prem, going back to the cloud, or they can all be in the cloud. My goal is to have something that is relatively easy to just spin up, you know, in the cloud <laughs> without having to think about any externalities. So I know I've gone from being, oh, we'll get around to the cloud eventually to being all cloud. <laughs> like, so, so I don't like, so it's me. I want everything that I have, um, you know, everything that I'm working on as we rebuild the 090 system. We want everything to be viewing things that are in the cloud, but we don't want to have anything on in the hardware that we, on, you know, for virtual events. We don't want to have any of those. And, and if we're feeding them in, we're feeding them in as raw elements. Um, next question. 
Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, up next. How does the other gear affect your mixer choice? Guy mentioned the Rupert Nee primary source enhancer. Why do we want one? Uh, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I was looking and oogling over the new DM7, and there was a, a one that was just uh, over there hooting and hollering at the primary source enhancer when uh, he I could hear him. I was on, on another section of the room, and I could hear him just like excited as he was doing these uh, little like these little tests, uh, there was in room PA systems and he was using uh, Axiance and he was micing everybody up and he was just walking around the room testing this stuff and he just couldn't believe how good it sounded. And I was listening, uh, to the, on headphones to what it was going to sound like going out to the stream. And I was like, what, what do you got over there? And so he started showing me this, uh, Rupert Neve. He's like, this primary source enhancer is where it's at with this, uh, DM seven. And I was like, man, it sounds super clean on my end. So I, I was impressed with it. I don't know exactly what the Rupert Neve, uh, source and primary source enhancer does. Uh, it's a $1,999 outboard piece of gear if you were to buy it, but this is integrated as just a plugin inside of, uh, that you can just pull up inside of the DM seven. And I believe inside the DM three as well. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it depends on your mixer because a lot of the, the mixers have plugins now. Like my Roadcaster Pro here has the Aphex, uh, they, which they license all those al algorithms from Aphex for enhance audio enhancement, uh, which you can now, you know, for dynamics control and speech emphasis uh, that, uh, that uh, used to be used a lot of times in the old analog days uh, for processing voiceover stuff. So a lot of that stuff that used to be outboard equipment is now built in because it's emulated in uh, DSP-based mixers. So if you have a DSP-based mixer, look and see if a plugin is available. Maybe the Rupert Neve primary source enhancer is a plugin too. Next question. Henry Ramos in Yonkers, New York, saw a social media post of an event broadcast facility with Windows Blue Screen of Death screens saying that they moved the event to the cloud last minute and saved the event. Know of any other examples of this? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Well, I'm really guessing that they did a lot of, they were doing a lot of testing and this was just a, hey, we need to do it, so let's do it. Uh, in my productions, I can actually move from Windows machines to Mac machines fairly easy uh, with NDI, with uh, with Dante, with a lot of all these uh, other protocols. It's, it's getting super easy where the hardware is not really the, the determining factor or the, the computer is not really the determining factor. It's the hardware that you have. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. Has anyone ever worked with Cubase or Nuendo? I've been using Cubase as my main DAW and very impressed by its scale slash chord assistant features. In both cases, I there's a lot of people that like uh, that like both of those. <laughs> so it's it's a uh, um, but but I don't know a lot of them that are using it. So so I don't. Um, we've definitely seen Nuendo, especially in some of the Atmos. <laughs> Uh, pipelines that we've that we've worked with so those, those are some some things to look at there um and it would be really great to have another question <laughs> so like we didn't, there we go <laughs> go ahead chris hey guys so uh, i was just going to say um just briefly uh, as far as uh the cubase or nuendo people absolutely are using that uh i believe elliot shiner uh, who's one of the greatest engineers in the world who's one of the pioneers of atmos mixing um, I believe he uses Nuendo, uh, which I was shocked to uh, to hear that. But um, he is like you can see his work; it speaks for itself. And uh, yes, absolutely, pros are using it. Pro Tools is absolutely like the industry standard in there. Um, Logic also very much. These DAWs all sound the same. It's all about workflow. It's about what the job you're doing, and you know what makes sense to you and your own approach. So, next question. Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia, snuck in with, My brother needs a quality audio interface for the MV7. No longer wants to use USB. What's the panel's recommendation? Go ahead, Chris. So for interfaces, there's this is like... You kind of have to look at the whole scope of what an interface is, okay? You have one device here that is doing many, many different things, right? You've got your preamps, you've got your, your analog to digital conversion, digital to analog conversion, and then whatever other feature sets they set in here. So this is a lot of stuff all crammed into one box, okay? The lesser in cost you get, the more smoke detector wire essentially is holding this thing together. As you go up, these feature sets obviously get 
they get built in better and better. I really like the Apollos. I think are a great, great. Um, it, it's a great product, and there's really a lot of options. They have some bus powered options. You can, yeah. So I mean, there's definitely stuff in there you can do. And the question is, why doesn't he want the the USB interface? So, like, what is he trying to gain out of that? I think is the thing that you want to take into a question that we can answer it. Like, does he want to run into a mixer? But otherwise, it works pretty well as as, a, as an interface. Um, we have Mike. We're talking about micing instruments here in just a second. Um, uh, just a rem- reminder that tomorrow we'll have Ben Kolak on. He's a filmmaker and a drone uh, a drone operator as well, and he's going to be. It's going to be great to have him on to talk about filmmaking and drones. Uh, NDI Super Panel is on Friday, so if you've got NDI questions, that's going to be a place to be.